Hello, I'm Will Yeoman, CEO of Writing WA, and welcome to another edition of Pod Street, where we're recording today from the fourth floor of the beautiful State Library of Western Australia, where Writing WA is based. And it's my pleasure to introduce the artist and poet Tinika van der Eken. Uh, Tinika, welcome to Pod Street. Uh, thank you, William. So nice to be here and to have this beautiful view over the city. Yeah, it's one of the attractions of this library, isn't it? You get this sort of wonderful vista, and on a day like today, the sky is cl- a little bit cloudy, so it's quite varied isn't it? Yes we had huge storms overnight and but it's cleared up so it'll clear our minds as well. <laughs> Indeed now I mean what interests me about your practice because it's quite varied as well and I'm, I'm often reminded of the great artists of the past unfortunately usually men like Michelangelo who were wonderful poets as well as uh, visual artists he, you know he was an architect a sculptor uh, you know a painter maker of frescoes and so forth and I know your focus is very different because you also specialise in what we would traditionally call craft, but it's much more than that because it is uh, art as well. So I'd like to know how you, just as an initial question, how you how you see your your practice as a whole, rather than being separate, discrete elements. Yeah, um, thanks. It's a really good question. I I like to see myself as a a creative responding to uh, the world surrounding us and having not being limited to one particular way of expression and sometimes you want to write something down and sometimes you just want to you see something visual that you want to explore and then you you pick a medium that you might uh, be able to master in the way that you can express what you've got in mind so for me I'm I'm traversing different mediums and I uh, I enjoy that uh, transitioning uh, and and finding and, and searching and scoping which is part of the of the practice I think mm. I mean in a uh, previous life I'm, I studied criminology which is also multidisciplinary so you're looking at human behavior and and um, and a society as a as a society of law from different perspectives and I find that interesting so it keeps me interested it keeps me passionate it keeps me searching and discovering and I think that's what I do in art as well Mm. Look, I find that really interesting, and I do recall the um, last exhibition of yours, which was relatively recently, a few months ago now that I visited. You did combine the spoke, well, sorry, the written word with the visual as well, um, which uh, that includes uh, pieces of jewellery and so forth, but also works on the wall as well, not just the words. So that was was that was that a rare example of pulling everything together for one exhibition? Um, it was a first in a series, but I now have three actually, and um, two finished, and a, another one in. Um, in the makings, they I, I see them as narratives, and um, they are visual narratives. But they bring in words, and they bring in um, small objects, wearable objects as well. Uh, often, I mean, even as a jewellery maker, people like or appreciate my work because it has a story. So they're all stories that connect. And what I've been doing in these solo exhibitions, which seem to be uh, taking on. <laughs> um, is to 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 do to have a narrative about eco fragility, which and there is a lot to say about that in a in a state like WA, where there's so much um, diversity in the ecosystem and things that threaten that diversity and and create fragility. So um, I'm I'm finding that I need more than words and more than visual to do to explore that. So it's it's become an exhibition of of um, works in fine metal but also corrosion cast, which is a resin that uh, takes the form of, of a vascular system of life, you know, life throbbing, but then stopping. And so I've, yeah, I've... I really enjoy um, finding all these forms to express that narrative. So people uh, who come and visit the exhibition will be, um, um, I I guess, excited by different aspects. A child might might like uh, one of the works. Well, the the, the parents would see the sort of the science behind it or, you know, um, and I think that's part of the... uh, what we do to bring a narrative to an audience, mm. that it, it has various ways of, of, of connecting. 
look, you're absolutely right. And this also applies to your last collection, which was um, published in 2022, A Place to Land, um, because it's very clear to me that the uh, the focus on craft, on language, on memory, on, on narrative is not only strong, but it's you, you do think a lot about communication and accessibility, don't you? These are poems that anyone could read at any level, just as you've described with your other work. Mm. Um, yes, including some poems that bring words in foreign language, which is kind of unusual in an English uh, context because everybody who is born with the English language thinks they don't, they don't, <laughs> they don't need anything else. And of course, you can get a, a long way in the world without, without um, leaving the English language. Uh, language, but for me, being born in Belgium, it's um, having various languages surrounding me brings in different worlds, and so I can bring those worlds uh, on just by bringing one of the words in do- those languages uh, to the page, and and I guess it's. Um, uh, it makes it a different volume and, yeah, hopefully exciting. Yeah, look, I find that interesting too, the fact that you don't, as a reader, you don't need to speak those languages to really hear the music, you know, because some of it's left untranslated. Um, and I'm absolutely fine with that. And I'm assuming most other people will be as well because the music's inherent in the language. Mm, that's right. And, um, of course, when you hear it, it's, it's, it's one way of appreciating it. But reading it on the page, they have a different form. They have, you know, it's... It's exciting, yeah. Hmm. Well, okay, so speaking of reading on the page, are you going to read us a poem from the collection? Um, sure, why don't I write, read one of um, about music, about Jacques Brel. I think some people uh, would be familiar with Jacques Brel, although he's, um, he's, um, he's from Belgium and most of his work is in French. He, has, he had some songs uh, and poems um, in Flemish though and he even though it wasn't his na- native language they were always beautiful and his metaphors were just so strong and worked in Flemish as well um, so we we like to to sort of claim him um, and in Flanders as well as in, um, in Wallonia and other parts of Belgium so this is an ode to Jacques Brel we're in a playhouse bar near closing time Cigarette smoke curls around your profile. The piano drifts from Le Putain d'Amsterdam and Hamza the hero at the Battle of Waterloo. Je m'appelle Hamza. You sing enemies and friends, Jeff and Antoine, harborless men, hearts yearning for a safe port, Le Port d'Amsterdam. You make us look for Marique Marique entre les tours de Bruges et and buy bonbons for Matilda because flowers tend to die. Behind the swirl of the smoke, la chambre sans berceau, a bedroom without a cot. Non, Jeff, t'es pas tout seul. Salut, Antoine, je vais mourir. It's hard to die in spring. The great warrior Hamza defeated. You traded death for paradise, North Sea for Tahiti. We sing la chanson des vieux amants and cry. Je t'aime encore, tu sais. Je t'aime. Mm, look, that, that's really beautiful. Certainly one of the favourite poems in the collection for me, and you've just brought it alive. You actually, you, well, not actually, obviously you're a very beautiful reader too. Is that something that's important to you, um, to perform these poems? Um, yes, I love reading uh, my work for an audience. I mean, I think this is why we write, to, to connect with other people. And um, yes, yeah, so I do really enjoy uh, public readings and even, you know, in the private space of a dinner party or... Um, yeah, of course, when when, when there's a, a moment or... And I must say, my, my mother, who is a polit- was a politician, but also a poet, always had poetry in her speeches. And so for us, it's a way of, um, of connecting, using very little words to say a lot and, um, and using moments when you have people's attention to, to, to bring something to the space, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, so it's clear why you're attracted to poetry in particular, but you are also a memoirist and you're working on a, on a new novel, I believe, as well. So you're a novelist too. So where, where does that part of your creativity stem from? Um, 
I wanted to be a writer when I was a child, but and I was writing stories about the sheep in our backyard and about the ducks and how they communicated with each other. And, uh, but I really thought if I want to write books, I need to have something to say. Um, so I, I didn't write, do any creative writing for years until I returned from Africa, having worked there for eight years, and there was so much going on in uh, living that life and uh, interacting with, um, um, with people on a day-to-day -day basis and having incredible experiences that when people ask me, so, so how was that? Being in Africa, you can't really say in one sentence uh, what how what it was like, and uh, and there was there's a lot to say. So I I lifted one story out of the many experiences and decided to write the story of of Café d'Afrique, a, a little restaurant I was involved in, to use that as a framework for telling of my experience. And I think I like I like to do that. So tr the second book, Traverse, was also based on a on, on an, uh, a real ex life experience, but I've sort of mem mem fictionalized it slightly to make it really readable for a, a reader. You don't need the, 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 the minutia of, of everyday life. When you're telling a story, you really want to come to the crux of that story and bring it to the page as lively as possible. So, um, and the third book is, also based on life experience, but it is more uh, of it's, it's really more of a fiction story because I've um, I've created fictional characters, uh, but I've set them in a world that I'm familiar with, which is mediation in um, in the prison and justice system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinary. I mean, going back to the idea of having needing something to write about or feeling that you need something to write about. I think that's interesting because there are a lot of uh, writers out there who perhaps are more interested in the idea of being a writer and perhaps don't quite have anything to say immediately and their work is, is often excellent but there's something missing. There's no, there's no heart and there's no soul and when I read your work it's clearly coming from a very personal place. I mean at the moment I'm reading um, Sarah Holland Blatt's wonderful collection The Jaguar same yes. thing isn't it yes. it is so powerful mm. um, extraordinary mm. and and that brings into sharp relief a lot of other things you read which are technically on the surface beautiful but just are lacking so I wanted to know if you and this is sort of broadening it out a bit to thinking about writers who are and poets who are perhaps starting out is that a, a good piece of advice to, to make sure you've actually got something to say which, which seems obvious in one sense but isn't um Yes, and I, I, I do think that there are young writers who are technically excellent, who do have something really strong to say as well. And, you know, even though they're in their 20s and might not have decades of life experience, but they, they manage to filter the, the exact story out of the, uh, uh, their life experience. So I was recently reading an, a novel um, by Lisa uh, Spitt, a Bel uh, Belgian author, who is just, you know, um, everybody's loving her work and she's now have a, have a second novel and it's, they're huge, they're like 500 pages, but you just can't stop reading and she has so much to say in, in, in the story. So I, I don't think it's an age thing, but it's, it's a way of looking at the world and, and finding, communicating uh, through detail and through connections what you, um, what might be true. Yeah, but it's interesting you say that because I can't remember the name of the author. It was quite a famous author who said no one should write a book before the age of 40. <laughs> well, yes, having read Lisa Spitt and a few other, Marika, um, um, oh, yeah, can't remember her second name now, but she, they're just amazing, amazing writers. Mm. And yeah, so I have to uh, hold my opinion there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, of course, it's, it's a rather sweeping statement. Um, thinking about how you, as in you know the the universal you, we think about ourselves as artists or writers. To what extent does that give you the confidence to go forward? Because I was just reading something about the great twentieth uh, century ceramicist um, Louise Rie, who said uh, she, and she said, "Look, I make pots. That's what I do." 
Mm. Well, you know, what an understatement. She was just a superb artist and craftsman, but she was very down to earth. She said, look, I just, I just make pots. It's almost like a, a tree bears fruit. It just does it. Yes. But, but it's, it's, so it is important that you frame yourself and you say to yourself, I am a writer, I am a poet, I am an artist, or do you just, just get on with the job and you don't have those conversations in your head? Um, I wish I could say that I was always as confident about every part of what I do um, because it does come in waves and there's times that you feel that I feel really you know um, like the 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 visual artist and other times I feel like the writer and the author but not always at the same time and I guess it's I don't do these activities all at the same time either so um, but yeah it is a breathing and and um, I'm fortunate to now uh, work from home, have my time to myself, a lot of unstructured time that I can actually s- go intuitively to where I want to be that day, if I want to be in my studio making or if I want to write a poem or, you know, so, I mean, there are things like mm. deadlines and stuff like that, practical things, exhibitions coming up or, or publications, but you, uh, most of the time I just go with where I, I feel I... I I want to be, yeah. So it's not like you say, you don't take a persona and put it on like you might a piece of clothing, like, okay, now I'm a mother, now I'm a lover, now I'm a poet, now I'm an artist. <laughs> it's just uh, very organic and natural, isn't it? That's right, that's right. We're, it's it's more like an, an onion, you know, with all the layers that we, we inhabit at the same time, but, you know, one might be um, prickling a little bit more than the other one. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm very curious to know how you actually ended up in Perth, of all places. Oh, well, um, we, so I met my previous husband um, in, in Africa and we, where we were both working. And after nine years of work there, we returned to Belgium. He was also from Belgium. And but being a geologist, he really didn't want to be in the flat country Belgium is and amongst the clay. And uh, I mean, there is so much more geology to explore in the world. So he was offered uh, to do his PhD here in Perth. And, and so I... Um, uh, I followed with the children, yeah, so against my will, I must say it at the beginning, but it, it, I have really grown to appreciate this, and I love being here now, yeah. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about your, uh, going back to your uh, work in three dimensions, which I might say is, gives a nice contrast to the poetry and prose and so forth, um, because you've got an exhibition coming up in my former hometown of York in September. Can you tell us a little bit, about, give us a sneak preview of that? Mm. Yes, it's called Arborea, and it is really about um, lungs and trees and how trees are the lungs of the world. And looking at this from a, 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 a geological perspective in that the Anthropocene we live in is very much a time when our human behavior influences how the planet uh, survives. So how our forests have been forests have been faring, how they have become uh, um, um, monoculture fields of, of canola, and um, and yet we, what we're still having the the, the huge uh, diversity in the southwest in forests, and so it's really exploring trees, uh, lungs, um, forests, and I'm using the uh, medium of corrosion casting, which is really a um, uh, made, you know, they, these are sculptures made in a lab um, with real lungs and real bodies, so that you see a vascular system of uh, of a, a sheep's head, a vascular system of of a sheep's lung, but also some, and this is uh, quite um, novel and might be a bit confronting, like uh, primates, little monkeys um, that have. Um, uh, inhabit the forests of the world and I do want to look beyond our own borders of, of Australia because uh, we are part of a larger ecosystem and uh, and so these um, the monkeys now are medical um, research uh, subjects rather than inhabitants of the forest so 
Um, these are all part of an exhibition where um, I bring, in, I use precious metal as well to celebrate uh, the stones that we have, beautiful gemstones here in the, the chrysoprase, so the greens and the, uh, and the emeralds and, you know, lots of things from uh, yeah. Western Australian soil, uh, acacia seeds, curly and, and, and um Whimsical, and you know, to express some of the uh, of, of the beautiful um, uh, diversity we have here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, just going back to the poetry now, for example, um, to what extent does your different disciplines influence each other? Because I'm thinking about you know, you're working in three dimensions. You're working with material, mm -hmm. and sound is a material too. Words are material. So I'm wondering whether there's a sort of backward and forwards dialogue between the different forms. Yeah, well, interesting in that particular exhibition in Arborea, I, uh, I've, I have one poem displayed uh, on the wall and, um, and I chose to have the full poem there rather than a quote. And it's a poem about a cyclone, a cyclone that um, happened in, in, I think a year and a half ago in uh, around Calberry and swept through the wind belt um, and because um, there were hardly any forests and old growth uh, trees whole stopping that it, it was a lot was 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 destroyed and uh, so I'm in that poem I take the viewpoint of of the cyclone um, so going it's like um, Fred Daguiar has a poem about a bullet and he's he's it, he's following the pathway of the bullet and the point of view of the bullet going into a school in the US so this is a cyclone coming into um, to Perth signifying you know we are uh, sorry not Perth but uh, Western Australia um, signifying we are really um, in in a t at a time where um, where storms and extreme weather are influencing um, what's happening but what we do also influences that weather so mm. um, so that poem is part of, of Arborea mm. because it is all about trees and breath and and the connectivity of these ecosystems. Yes, yeah, so there's a very clear connection between the work and the poetry as well. I mean, has, has um, environmental concerns of that, has that always informed your work or is that something that's grown over the years? Um, I grew up in Belgium, which is very, um, I mean, we used to have uh, floods occasionally. Uh, the polders are a very, uh, is, is, is land that has been gained from the sea. So they, they are lower than the sea level. Um, uh, so, in, in a way, there's a fragility there. Um, but it wasn't in, until I moved to um, Zambia and Burundi and then Australia here, to, uh, I really appreciated the diversity of nature, you know, which in the urbanized setting Flanders is, we didn't, we didn't know. Uh, but n knowing that what, what nature can give us, I just... Um, I fell in love with it and I fell in love with not just you know the land but also the ocean and you know snorkeling and diving and just exploring and seeing what diversity is there so I and over over the last few decades I've also witnessed how much is 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 being lost and how much is disappearing and that's yeah it breaks my heart yeah and I'd really want to uh, yeah, I express that in, in my art more now than I did before, mm. yeah. And have you found, since you've been doing that, that art has proven to be um, quite a, a good vehicle for communicating those concerns to uh, the public? Um, yes, especially visual art, I think, is, uh, is, is um, because um, in jewellery and metalsmithing, you work with natural objects and, you know, encapsulate a stone or cast a seed into into metal and using precious metal to actually um, eternalize these forms is, is, is a beautiful way of, of, of honouring, I, I believe. So um, I think it's a, for me, it was straightforward to do that. To, to, to transform these forms into something eternal or capture a little bit of a bark that, of a tree that might be extinct in a few years, that maybe that little bit of bark will, might be the only thing remaining if it's made in gold because gold will never disappear. You know, mm -hmm. gold will always be gold. So mm -hmm. that kind of um, 
transitioning and and holding is uh, for me was was evident for, in visual art and I guess in poetry it's only more recently with through you know an online group with Kath Drake that I've really tuned into eco poetry and um, and being, become part of some forums uh, exploring that. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, Jenica, it's been a pleasure having you on Pod Street. It's been a long time coming, but we've got there in the end. Yeah. Now, if people are interested in purchasing a copy of A Place to Land or indeed interested in your exhibitions and anything else you're doing, do you have a, a, um, a website or anything that people can access? Sure. Um, TinicaCreations.com is the place to go. Um, there are also some uh, good bookshops around, like New Editions and Crow Books that stock the um, the poetry collection uh, but yeah my website also has it 